Now, promoters of agroecology in Ghana are intensifying their campaigns for government to take a serious look at encouraging the use of more organic fertilizers and investing in agroecological farming methods which are natural. The Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development, SICOT, says farm inputs are becoming very expensive in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine war. The reason government needs to take natural methods of farming and sustainable agriculture seriously. They have been leading some farmers and officials of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture on a tour of agroecological agro farms in the Upper East region, dubbed the Agroecological Caravan. Correspondent Albert Sorry has more. Agroecology is a farming method based on applying the interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment within agricultural systems. By doing this, agroecology can support food production, food security, and nutrition whilst restoring the ecosystem. The Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development, SICOD, and the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana have been promoting the concept of agroecology for some time now. Wilberforce Latte is the Deputy Executive Director for the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development. We are beginning to lose control of our farming systems. The kind of farming we are doing is heavily dependent on um, external inputs. So we've been promoting the low external inputs and, and sustainable agriculture, what we call agroecology, a kind of farming where our indigenous knowledge and practices of farmers are important, you know, to agricultural production. This year, this organization and their partners are intensifying their efforts to get more farmers to understand and adapt agroecological practices. More importantly, they want the government, through the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, to take this natural farming method more seriously. We need to revisit our farming systems. Thanks to the Russia-Ukraine war, fertilizers and other agro-inputs have become a challenge. And we think that this way of farming will reduce this kind of dependency. And so we've been promoting agroecology. Well, our dream is that at the end of the day, we should have uh, district directors of agri championing agroecology, working together with CSOs. SICOD has been leading some farmers and officials of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture on a tour of agroecology farms in the Upper East region. Dubbed the Agroecology Caravan, the tour was meant to educate the participants on agroecology and how it is implemented. First, the participants visited the Abarike Agroecology Farm, owned by Joseph Abarike. Located at Bolgatanga in the Upper East region, Abarike's farm includes fish ponds and gardens. He also rears various livestock on the farm. Therefore, he gets natural fertilizer when he pumps out saturated waste water from the fish ponds into the gardens. He feeds his livestock from cuttings, weeds, and other things that are not needed in the gardens. And droppings from the livestock also provide him manure. All these keep his farm natural and sustainable. The agroecology caravan visited another agroecology farm at the Gundog community in the Nabdam district of the Upper East region. The owner, Fuseni Bogbon, grows a wide variety of food and cash crops, including cassava, maize, and pawpaw. He has also managed to grow some cocoa trees, even though the climate in this part of the country is believed to be unfavorable for cocoa. I just introduced uh, myself into agroecology because it is just uh, an integrated way of farming. And whatever comes out of that system is very healthy because no usage of toxic substances. 
because everything is contributed by the crops itself naturally because it uh, it recycle itself to maintain the soil fertility officials from the ministry of food and agriculture who joined the agroecology caravan said they were impressed about what they had seen on the farms esther ajekum is an assistant director with the crops services directorate of the ministry we are impressed with what is here naturally the climate here wouldn't support the production of certain um, crops that typically does well in uh, down south but impressively we are seeing cocoa we have seen mangoes thrive we have seen fields that are cultivated to purple we've even seen fish pond and all that so clearly it demonstrates that we agroecology we can improve on our biodiversity she says there is opportunity for agroecology farmers to get technical assistance from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Some of the farmers on the agroecology caravan were excited about what they experienced. They made some appeals to government. Financial uh, resources is a factor and uh, of course other logistical support for instance, like um, seed to borrow and invest that in agroecology because it is slow growing. But we need to have a differences in terms of interest rate when it comes to agroecology. All these things are areas that government can intervene so that if somebody who is selling cement is borrowing at the rate of 28%, somebody who is doing agroecology should be given a lesser interest rate. We would need uh, vehicles like uh, Moto King or maybe Power Tiller or stuff like that to convey the manure to the fields. So if maybe government can, can help us in this direction by supporting us with uh, like the tools that we have to work with. For now, SICOD and other promoters of agroecology will continue their push for the complete adoption of this natural, sustainable system of farming. Albert Sori, Joy News, Bolgatanga. We'll revisit the story later on in this bulletin. But for now, let's move on to other stories here on Newsdex. Now, the UA police has in their custody a 45-year-old man suspected to have been selling fake and unwholesome drugs to the unsuspecting public. The unregistered licensed drug dealer, Bapuri Dawi Manuel, who owns God's Blessing Herbal, was arrested by FDA personnel from the Upper West Office. Joy News is Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam. Report from UA. According to the acting Naples regional director of the Food and Drugs Authority, Calvin Dafari, his outfit had a tip off from the World Magazine where the alleged fake drug dealer for weeks has been plying his trade and they quickly mounted a search for him. So we traced and went to the World Magazine and he saw us and ran away. So we mounted surveillance of him and we had him around 9 p.m. yesterday in the night. He was somewhere selling the drugs. When we caught him, we brought him to this place. We asked of where his manufacturing facility is. Initially, he was very resistant, but we pleaded and employed all our techniques. Then he brought us here. So when he brought us here, we saw that, uh, as you can see, it's a single room. It does the production, it does everything in this room. It was also revealed that the 45 year old owner of God's Blessing Herbal, Papure Dao Emmanuel, started the act as a minister number two in the Wanchi municipality where he claimed the market was not good, hence his relocation to the Upper West region. Further investigations revealed that he is not a licensed drug dealer, nor the drugs registered. So we asked whether uh, the product was registered. He even told us that the product was registered. So we asked for the registration certificate or registration letter from the Food and Drug Authority. Lo and behold, he gave us an agenda, a program agenda that he attended in Bono region. And that was the, the program agenda he's using and telling people that Food and Drugs Authority has registered his products. So when we check the products, we realize that it's one product in different containers and he's using different labels to, to put on it. So
So one product by different levels, seven uh, is marketing them as a cure for different conditions. So you pick this one and attach it. This one is for diabetes. This one is for hypertension. Meanwhile, it's one drug that he's selling. Despite caught in the act and the unlicensed and insanitary facility used to manufacture the electric drugs, Vaporedo Emmanuel is still defiant, touting the efficacy and potency of his products. Oh. Uh, he's, he's, he's doing so many things. If someone is pissed by some uh, waste, somebody is pain by some part of the body, and he used this ointment to apply their part, is about 30 minutes. If the part is still paining the fellow, then you will see anyone want to buy some from me. Tell the fellow that you say take it, not the medicine I'm selling. Are you registered? Uh, uh, when I, uh, so I'm are you registered with Oh, you? I'm not your registered. He has since been handed over to the World Police for further investigations. The acting apostle director of the Food and Drugs Authority has his advice for the public. You should be worried of these people. Or you see someone peddling drugs. It's not, we are not even allowed to peddle drugs. So we should resist from buying drugs from a peddler. If you are sick and you want drugs, please go to a pharmacy or you go to a licensed over the counter medicine seller and buy your drugs. Let's resist from buying drugs from people who go around selling drugs. Even if they tell you that they are lances, this man, can you imagine that he was moving around with an agenda of a program that Food and Drugs Authority has organized as a registration certificate? So you don't do that. So the public should be very uh, wonderful of people like this. And when they see them, please, they should try and report them to the Office of the Food and Drugs Authority. What for the news, Rafik Salam. Whatever you go do, you go. Let's just stay in the Upper West region because 52-year-old businessman Abdul Nasir Sani has been retained as the Upper West Regional Chairman of the National Democratic Congress, polling 227 vote to defeat his challenger, Adam Malhassan Randi, who polled 157 vote. The Regional Secretary of the Party, Charles Lowanga Pozong, also retained his position, flaming out the ambition of the former regional youth organizer, Nicodemus Derry. Join us with Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports. Four years ago, the Limayri World Starlet, Abdul Nasr Sani, entered the championship contest as a clear favorite, contesting against a weakened and underperformed incumbent chairman who lost everything, including four parliamentary seats to the MPP in the 2016 election and won by a landslide. This election is therefore a referendum on the leadership of Abdul Nasr Sani called by most of his admirers as Chairman Bonas. The dynamics of this election is however different with varied interest from several stalwarts and financiers of the party whose names are not on the ballot papers but want to pull strings in the party for their personal interest. Chairman Bonas, however, wants the status quo to remain focused on the party's project of winning all 11 parliamentary seats coupled with an increased presidential votes for the party given another four-year mandate. His lone challenger, 42-year-old business project consultant, Adams Alassane Randy, agrees, however, wants a change in the safe's captainship. 384 delegates have the mandate to decide their fate. The choreographed arrangement of the voting hall did little to reduce the tension and deep-seated rift. The highest point was when Adams Randy steps up to extend pleasantries with a high table and was given a cold shoulder. Former defense minister and chairman of the National Council of Elders of the NDC, Alaji Mama Idrisu, was admonishing the delegates to do the needful. He went in for the juggler of the ruling MP. We are a family. We can never anything right if we are not united. Look at the present government we have today, the disorder in the NDP, because there is no rule for them to follow. Let us conduct this Congress, this election with honesty. After close to three hours of voting and sorting of the ballots, 
Upper West Regional Director of the Electoral Commission, Ali Osman Ademu, declared the results retaining Bonas as the regional party's chair, together with his scribe, lawyer Charles Wanga Pozun, who defeated all four and former regional youth organizer Nicodemus was there. Charles Luanga Pozun polled 233 votes. Nicodemus and B.D. Derry polled 151 votes. And Charles Luanga Pozun is declared the winner of the election. Ab Abdul Nasser Sani polled 227 votes. And Al Hassan Adams polled 157 votes. No rejected votes. 384 people cast the vote. United with the sun, divided with four. I'm opening my doors to call on whoever. There's no loser, there's no winner. We have all won. And this has won. So our now, now our main aim and target and objective is to take the 11 seats as we promised to the people of Upper West. There was no space for consensual speech because at the time that the results were announced, all the vanguists and their supporters had left the voting hall. A clear sign that the NDC is deeply and dangerously divided. The first task for the new chairman is for him to bring both sides together. We also pledge to bring together all aspirants who contested and were not lucky to be victorious back into the fold to enable us to work properly. You will know that those of us who have been retained, it is based on hard work that we put in. And we will continuously work hard to enable us win election 2024. The election, however, produced four casualties. They included incumbent regional organizer and former war mayor Isaku Nuputia, who lost to his DBT, Munibahara Thomas, whilst Isaac Antajere returned to the communication office after four year hiatus, defeating incumbent Prosper Poire. Haji Cecilia Hamza bows out as the upper West Region women organizer after 12 years to pave way for her anointed successor, Haji Memuna Mahama Yaya, who served as one of her deputies. The 38 delegates, however, has other ideas and went in for her other deputy, Prisca Kupol. Reporting for Jay News, Rafik Salam. Wa. So help me, God. Now, uh, moving on to other stories, the district chief executive for the Guan district, Janet MFA Obro Adebo, has admonished residents in the district to be mindful of fire outbreaks as the dry season beckons. She is calling on women especially to keep flammable substances away from children. She made the remarks when she presented some relief items to a family of five who lost all properties, including cash to a fire that gutted their home at Likpek Bala in the OT region. Peter Seno has more in the following report. On the 29th of October 2022, at about 1 p.m., one of the rooms in this building started burning, later spreading to the other five rooms. It took the assistance and efforts of residents for hours, but to no avail as the new district has no fire station to attend to them. Buckets of water, knapsack, and motorized spraying machines were the items used to douse the flames. Cash amounts and all valuables were lost in the four-hour fire. The assembly member for Likwebala, Augustine Ota, thinks if there were a fire station in the district, the extent of damage would have been minimal. He's asking government to consider establishing a fire station in the district. We don't have fire service. We don't have fire service. We are now trying to appeal so that uh, if the government can do anything possible within this time around, so that if we can have this fire attendance or any office, and then that one, it will help. Because as we speak like this, if it happens and you fall under hallway, hallway is too far. Before they will get back to this place, I think everything will be lost like it has just happened. Felix is one of the family members. According to him, they need public assistance so the family could manage through this difficult time. The, the philanthropist who can support the family to give us a, a maximum support so that we can 
at least uh, put things in shape whereby the family will no more uh, die for this particular disaster. The DC for the Guan District, Janet MFA Obro Adibo, wants families to take some precautions as the dry season approaches after providing some relief items for the victims. In this very situation, it is a very bad one. Our mother who owns the house is a stroke patient. And then she has other children who are occupying other rooms. We have a, a student who has his laptop and all other things all bent. This time that we are entering the Hamatan season, it is not only the bushfires that destroys. Our children using matches, parents should be very careful how they put certain things down, like matches, those who can afford uh, fire extinguishers, they should make it available to be near the kitchen. Those who don't know how to operate, it should get the fire service people to come and teach them and they should also learn how to operate them. Peter Sanu for Joy News. Now, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has dissociated himself from an alleged claim by the Minister of State at the Presidency, Edu Boahing, to the effect that he, the Vice President, would accept just 200,000 US dollars token as an appearance fee and some positions by an investor for the Vice President's siblings to get his backing and influence in establishing a business in Ghana. The claim is captured in a latest uh, expose by uh, Tiger Eyes. Uh, Anas Army or Anas scheduled to be premiered later today. According to the vice president in a Facebook post, if the said claim by the minister is true, as captured in the said video, then Charles Edubohen should be dismissed. Here is full details of the Facebook post of the vice president. Now, it says that my attention has been drawn to a video by Anas Army or Anas as posted on his social media handle, showing the minister of state for finance, Mr. Charles Edubohen, apparently using my name in Ta'alia to peddle influence and collect money from supposed investors. I'd like to state that if what the minister is alleged to have said is accurately captured in the video, then his position as a minister of state is untenable. It should be dismissed summarily and investigated. I'm not aware of any such meeting held by Minister Edubuahing and or a supposed appearance fee. My most cherished asset in life is my integrity and I will not allow anyone to use my name to engage in corrupt activities. And that's uh, the post by the Vice President there. Now, meanwhile, news just coming in suggests the minister has been dismissed. Let's get more from the Facebook post um, uh, as uh, 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 announcing uh, that. But that it's on the Facebook page of the Director of Communications at the President, Eugene Aihing. Uh, the Vice President has stated or called for his dismissal if that uh, allegation is captured accurately in, in Anas's uh, uh, documentary and that he should be sacked. Now we are hearing that uh, the minister has indeed been dismissed. That, their statement reads, the president of the Republic, Nana Dodanko Ekufado, has terminated the appointment of Minister of State at the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Charles Edubuahin, with immediate effect. After being made aware of the allegations leveled against the minister in the expose, Galamse Economy, the minister and the president spoke to Mr. Edubuahin, after which he took the decision to terminate his appointment and also to refer the matter to the special prosecutor for further investigations. The president thanked Mr. Edubuahin for his strong services to his government since his appointment in 2017 and wished him well in his future endeavors. And that's signed by Eugene Ahin, director of communication at the presidency. So Multimedia Group Limited, uh, uh, you know, swept more of the awards at this year's GJ Awards, sweeping eight awards, the highest so far any media house uh, got in the 2022 Ghana Journalist Awards. Manuel Crante won the most promising journalist of the year with uh, our reporter at uh, Joy Prime winning investigative reporter of the year as well as uh, female reporter of the year. If you missed it, here's a wrap of the event. Ago. Ago. Consistency produces results, and so if we keep doing it wrong, we should not expect anything meaningful. The 26th Ghana Journalists Association Awards was dedicated to honoring journalists who have demonstrated exceptional reporting that highlights the nation's journey towards recovery from the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Joy News' Manuel Kranting was adjudged the most promising journalist of the year. Joy Prime's Francisca Encher won the Investigative Journalist of the Year Award and also grabbed the Best Female Reporter of the Year Award. Francis Angel, congratulations. Now, for me, I am so proud that a woman is bagging the award. Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah, I feel so delighted. You know, investigative journalism, it's a, a, a field in journalism that a lot of females feel it is not our place. They feel, let me just shift to entertainment, let me shift to health, let me do something else, but not investigation. They believe that it is something left for men to do. And they've held their title for so many years. And it was time we taught them a lesson that we also exist, we can't do it, you know. And so today I've been able to win this award and I'm sure this is going to inspire a lot of female journalists, a lot of females who actually feel like becoming investigative journalists or for some reasons are scared. Joy News features editor Jojo Cobbiner's Finding the Witch Hunters, a documentary which exposed the horrific torture women are led to be witches are subjected to in the northern part of the country was adjudged the best TV documentary of the year. The Witches Camp is a story that I have told um, right from the first year, first year of journalism. I mean, when I left journalism school, I've always, it has always fascinated me. And then beyond the fascination, I was actually worried for the many women who have been locked up in, uh, in witches camps and I, I mean, I've done the story several times, and then the very first um, attempt, um, water was provided to the people. But now I realize that beyond telling the story of how to improve the camps, we need to talk about the real harsh realities of those women, especially those women who, are, I mean, suffer a lot of bruises, who are cut, who um, um, are beaten, and some who are almost have been killed. And I wanted to shed more light on, on, on their plight. And I pray that this government will do something about it. I mean, special mention to Lucas. Lucas was a very wonderful um, cameraman. He, he was there. He saw all the horrific scenes at the witches camp, especially when we're going to look for visuals, especially interviewing um, people who had very traumatic stories to share. He stayed with me all throughout, and so a very special mention to him. The Ogwa fisherman, as he's popularly called in the newsroom, Richard Kudriyanku Siaku, when the last fish is caught, fetched him the Greek food security journalist of the year honors. Richard Kudriyanku is in Accra, and this time he's bagging another award, the best agri and food security award for the year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over the years, I've been telling stories of fisher folk. I've been going to sea with them. And incidentally, I'm called the president of the World Fishers Association. So I've been telling the stories about the fisher folk, their plight, where they live, what they do for a living, their livelihood matters. And so that is what I have kept on doing, and I'll do more. Now, for most people, all they see is the glitz and the glamour. For the story you told that won you this award, what are some of the challenges you went through on ground? Well, so I had to disguise myself as an observer, a fisheries observer, uh, go and investigate um, activities, illegalities on the sea. And so I had to stay away from my house. And then I was embedded with uh, the bigger fishing vessels. You know, they could throw you into the sea, but because there was an urgent need to tell that particular story. You know, Ghana imports close to 300 million worth of fish every year. And we have the big ocean here, but because of illegalities, we are unable to leverage on this advantage that we have. And so we have to sacrifice our foreign exchange. And so I had to tell that story because the artisanal fishers that are also there, they were suffering. Your most authoritative news analysis show, News File, was crowned the best TV and radio program of the year. Joy Business's Daryl Kwa was also declared the Business and Economic Journalist of the Year. Congratulations, well deserved. How do you feel though? Uh, seems unbelievable. I didn't see this coming, but um, I'm happy, I'm excited. Um, it's the first for Joy Business and it's the first GJ award for me, so it, it really counts. And I'm grateful to God and to everybody who has been of support uh, to me uh, reaching that far.
Interesting. Now, what should we expect from you in the years moving forward? Well, uh, for the past six, seven years, I've spent my time telling the stories of small businesses. Actually, the story that won me this was a Joy Business Van story, where we sort of tried to encourage people to, I mean, get over the current economic challenges and do something with their lives. And all over the country, young people are coming out and they are doing stuff for themselves. And it's a privilege to feature some of these stories on the Joy Business Van. And so I hope to keep continuing telling those stories and highlighting the great stuff that people right here in the country can do. We have been talking about inflation. We have been talking about the, the CD depreciating. And that's partly because we import so much. And there are so many people here who are doing amazing stuff that we can tell and sell. And so we, I, I'm going to continue doing that and uh, hopefully get another award. But hey, it's an uh, exciting one. A Doom TV Samuel Alfred Amwal's feature rejected over elephantiasis brought to the fore the story of a 29-year-old man from Bremen Isikuman in the central region who faced rejection from his family due to his medical condition. That feature earned him the disability reporting of the year honors. Now, when we say we are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism, trust us, Yenye Dede, we're simply stating the facts. Faustina Safo, and congrats to all award winners, especially those from the multimedia group. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with business. Stay with us. Hi, good morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Powell, the zonal director for Ekanu, Gono, Gono East and Ahapu regions at the Ghana Expo Promotion Authority. George Dankwa Meyao has charged local manufacturers to work towards adding value to their products to enable them meet international standards. Here's more in this report. The goal of the National Export Development Strategy Plan is to, amongst other things, achieve substantial increases on manufactured goods and services component of the country's exports to attain a projected aggregate of non-traditional exports. Speaking at a capacity building workshop for prospective exporters in Tichiman, Zonal Director in charge of the Ashanti, Bono, Bono East and Ahafo regions at the Ghana Exports Promotion Authority, George Dankwa Amiao, said the move is to encourage local manufacturers to add value to their products before exporting them. We are trying to tell everyone in Ghana to add a bit of value to their products before exporting it. So the president of the nation, Nana Dodanko Akufuado, formed partnership to develop this national export development strategy so that we will put things in place to help us recognize how we can add value to some of our products before exporting it. This is the only way that Ghana can get enough foreign exchange to be able to help with our foreign exchange reserves and our GDP growth, and in fact, to improve on the economy. He further noted that through the National Export Development Strategy Project, Ghana saw its exports increase by 17% in the year 2021. In fact, this year, 2021, when we were doing this national export uh, statistics, we realized that we've been able through this NETS to increase export by 17%. For a, for a very, very long time, this is something that we have done. And we believe that if people are able to adhere to all these strategic interventions and advice that we are giving in terms of these nets, there is no reason why by 2029 we cannot achieve our targets. Mahmouda Osman is the Ashanti Regional Director of the Ministry of Trade and Industries. He emphasized that government has, over the past few years, exhibited its commitment towards ensuring that much attention is given to exporters instead of importers. These and many more are some of the things government is doing just to make sure that our production capacity goes up and we are also able to export more. When you go to the Export Promotion Authority, they have export school, they have I mean, other incentives that exporters can take advantage of. This sensitization we are doing. 
um, it's not for importers, it's for exporters. It tells you that government is shifting attention on people who want to export rather than those who are importing. Regional head for the Food and Drugs Authority in charge of the Bono. Bono East and a half of regions, Equia and Ponsa, also encourage local manufacturers to work towards meeting the standards of the international market as they work towards exporting them. But we do training programs, we try to equip the manufacturers with the requisite knowledge in the good manufacturing practices so that they can satisfy the demands of the international um, market. There are standards, whatever you want to produce, there are standards you must be able to subscribe to. So we try to get our manufacturers to subscribe to those standards so that they can also export their products. Some of the participants of the workshop noted that the engagement has provided them with the requisite knowledge on how to get their products to the international market. Matilda Menuyebua is one of them. It has helped me a lot. In a way, let's take, let's take for instance, I'm a processor. It has shown me how to process my products to the international firm. And it has led me to the right people. Or I, I, I would say I've got the right linkage. So the solution is always here. So this program has helped me to get in contact with the right people at the right time. Anna Sabit, Joy News, Tichiman. Now, the commercial and SME director of Fidelity Bank, Alex Ejiamposa, says to generate enough export earnings to meet the needs of the country, the bank is strategically focusing on agriculture and exports. He says, as a local bank, measures have been put in place to support the food industry to generate the needed value for export. He was speaking at the Mango Value Chain Stakeholder Training in Sunyane, organized by Fidelity Bank, in partnership with the Eco Business Fund. Pesha Semevo has more. Participants drawn from across Ghana, including exporters, processors, and input dealers, took part in the two-day Mango Value Chain Stakeholder Training in Sunyai. Organized by Fidelity Bank in partnership with the Eco Business Fund, it aimed at addressing bottlenecks in mango production and exports such as pest and disease management, input sourcing, climate change certification, and access to finance, and also help improve the about 10 metric tons of mango per hectare and add value to the yields. Chairman of the National Mango Association, Anthony Botri, believes with the right support, the sector would meet its expectations. Problems must be solved with uh, inputs. You have to procure inputs. They have to be solved with knowledge. You need people who have the knowledge. And all these will cost money. Money is hard to come by, especially in the man uh, mango value chain. Uh, mango is really lucrative. But you need to have the fruits to be able to make the money. And so with uh, Fidelity and Eco Business coming in, we believe that they will make the necessary financing available for us to be able to buy the inputs, get the right resource persons to solve these problems. Commercial and SME Director of Fidelity Bank, Alex Ejeyam Ponsa, said the bank is offering the stakeholders in the food value chain the requisite training and support as they focus on agriculture and export to help generate the needed value. If you look at what we are going through today as a country, uh, we believe that it's because we are not generating enough uh, export um, proceeds to feed the need that we have. So as a bank, we're taking a strategic decision that agri and export is one of the key areas that we are going to focus and we are focusing on. Um, so we are supporting um, food, those in the food um, value chain production. That's the reason why if you look at the mango producers, for example, uh, we believe that it is key that we provide the needed support for them. Why they know be to export? Because sometimes the chemical residual in the produce that they generate is creating problem for us. Uh, first, uh, in, uh, pest infestation is another problem uh, that is actually hindering our ability to be able to export to the Western world. How do we resolve them? All the people that matters in resolving them have been put in this room and we want to provide solution. And if it matters that it's money that we need to put into it, we put the money into it as a bank to support it. Strategic advisor to Finance in Motion Eco Business Fund, Caleb Tanfu, stated that the current economic situation requires measures to ensure sustainable investment. The expectation and through this summit is to really listen, to understand where are the key points or the pinch points 
and how can investment in a quantifiable manner, um, it's not looking at it just purely from government support or stuff, but in a way that is financially sustainable. Where we find ourselves now uh, with the challenges in the country also calls us to action and to look for creative solutions to kind of be in, in order to be sustainable. Precious Sema for Joy Business, Sunyai. And that's it for business. Sports is coming up next. Do stay tuned. So we call it a wrap here because today the coach Otoado is naming his 26-man squad for Qatar 2022. Sports team will take it up and bring you that uh, uh, presentation live from uh, the, the venue. My name is Samuel Kodjobrez. There's more news on myjoinline.com. Good morning and stay with the sports team.